Hello, my name is Ann Helmreich, and I'm the director of the Baker Nord Center for the Humanities. And on behalf of myself and my colleagues, Mary Davis, who's here, Laura Hengelhold, who's disappeared, Laura here, um, the associate directors in the center, I want to um, welcome you. Thank you so much for coming today. I've been instructed to stand exactly here because my voice is being captured. So this is, um, if, if for some reason you can't see or hear me, do let me know. I want to extend a personal welcome to a few members of our audience. Um, Jenny Barbado, um, whose family's vision created our center. Um, members of the legal community who are earning your um, continuing education credit. If you did not pick up your packet, please see my colleague Paul Cox, who I owe another thank you to. Paul, could you wave your arm? Paul has your packets. <laughs> pockets and information and you need to turn your materials into him or one of our staff members before you leave tonight. Um, I also want to recognize members of senior scholars who are here and I look forward to getting to know all of you in our upcoming class. And I also want to say a welcome to the friends of the Baker Nord Center. I'm going to move away. If you are interested in joining our friends program, um, in supporting events such as this, we have invitations here, and please come see myself or one of my colleagues. Um, during this year, the Nord Family Foundation has agreed to match every, um, every friend's gift, and we're delighted by this because this effort will help us reach our financial goal for our yet-to-be-announced, you're our first public announcement of this, but we've been awarded a National Endowment for the Humanities Challenge Grant, um, which will require matching funds. So a press release will be, coming forth, will be forthcoming, but every contribution to our friends group will go to that larger effort. Before I introduce today's speaker, I want to give you a little bit of a brief context. The Baker Nord Center organizes its programming around an annual theme every year. And this year, our theme is the museum. And to help plan for our programming this year, last year, we gathered together a group of colleagues from arts and culture organizations, museums um, in our area, to identify what were hot button issues in the field. And one of the very first issues that group identified was the repatriation, that is the return of objects um, to countries of origin and what this meant for museums and, and the practice of collecting. And if you follow the news, you can understand why our colleagues are concerned about these issues. We then turned to our colleagues in the law school and asked for advice, um, particularly to Craig Nard and his assistant, Nicole Klug. And what we learned was that the world's leading legal scholar on cultural heritage and repatriation was just one chilly Midwest city away. <laughs> and we were very lucky to persuade her to come to Cleveland in January. Um, and I want to thank my colleagues in the law school, as well as Alice Simon and Nancy Pratt, for facilitating. Our guest speaker tonight is Patty Gerstenblythe, director of the Center for Art, Museum, and Cultural Heritage Law at DePaul College of Law in Chicago, where she is also a distinguished research professor of law. She earned her PhD in art history and anthropology and students in the room, as well as her JD from Northwestern University. So she holds a doctorate in art history and a JD. I could not think of a more perfect speaker for our series. She is senior advisor to the International Arts and Cultural Property Committee of the American Bar Association Section on International Law, and has also served as a member of the United States Cultural Property Advisory Committee. I'm having to truncate her CV quite um, a great deal. In addition to her teaching and service responsibilities, she's an active author whose voice is shaping the field. Time does not permit me to list all of her publications, but I'll point you to a few titles and also let you know that many of these articles are available on the Baker Nord website and from where you can download them. Recent titles include Acquisitions and Deacquisitions of Museum Collections, these, I'm abbreviating the titles, The Public Interest in the Restitution of Cultural Objects, The Legal Aspects of Controlling the International Market in Looted Antiquities, The Paradigm of Iraq, and her book, Art, Cultural Heritage, and the Law, published by Carolina Academic Press in 2004. With this distinguished record of publication, you can understand how delighted we were that Patty accepted our invitation to speak. Tonight, Patty Gerson Blythe will be speaking on the international market in ancient art and artifacts, preserving the past through regulating the market. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Gerson Blythe.
Thank you very much. After I hear that, I have to turn around and try to find out who you're talking about. <laughs> but I want to thank you for inviting me here. Um, Cleveland is no colder or snowier than Chicago. So um, that was not a hardship at all on my behalf. And I want to thank both the Baker Nord Center and the law school and Case Western Reserve University for inviting me here to speak to you. And I also want to thank the audience. It's wonderful to be able to get people out on a post-snow day uh, still to hear a lecture on these issues. The history of looting of cultural objects is very old. It goes back to antiquity. And what we'll see is through many, many centuries, most cultural looting was in fact associated with warfare rather than uh, what we see today. But by way of background, I begin with antiquity briefly. Uh, and the idea of cultural looting during wartime was an essential part of conquest and appropriation of the cultures of defeated peoples. And we see that well represented here in the Arch of Titus, which you can still see in Rome, where the menorah that had been the preeminent symbol in the Second Temple in Jerusalem, uh, when the temple was destroyed, it was carried off to Rome and it's shown here in a triumphal procession, again, to demonstrate the defeat of the people and the removal of cultural symbols in an effort to assimilate uh, uh, conquered people into the dominant culture. This continued, this theme, through many centuries, I'm skipping forward, obviously, many centuries here, to the time of the Napoleonic Wars in Europe. And you see something very similar. As Napoleon conquered much of Europe, he removed uh, through various mechanisms, in some case outright appropriation, in other cases he executed uh, peace treaties, but forced many countries to turn over their cultural objects. And particularly this was the case in uh, Italy, where Napoleon took many cultural objects in the effort to recreate Paris as the new Rome. And one of the pieces that he took, one of the famous pieces, was an ancient sculpture uh, called the Laocoon, an ancient Roman sculpture, which he took uh, to Paris. Even at the time of the Napoleonic Wars, though, it was already questioned whether this was an appropriate thing to do or not. And some French artists uh, applauded what Napoleon did, saying that Paris was the best place to put these objects, not only for the benefit of the French, but also for the benefit of everyone else, including the people whose cultural objects had been appropriated. Um, other people objected and said that artworks belonged in their original context and uh, opposed what Napoleon did. Now, at the end of the Napoleonic Wars was also the first modern example. There is an ancient uh, history example. Well, I'm hearing something from the next room, so excuse me for a moment. Uh, the, um, the end of the Napoleonic Wars is the first modern example of a conqueror not only refusing to take cultural objects. The Duke of Wellington, who was offered uh, these pieces from, from the Louvre, what later became the Louvre, refused to take them for his personal collection or for the English, and in fact insisted that most of them be returned. Now, not all of them, in fact, were returned. This painting uh, by Veronese uh, is still in the Louvre. It was supposed to be returned to Italy. Uh, the French somehow claimed that although they were able to get it to Paris, they weren't able to return it. <laughs> And in fact, it was this taking of objects, not so much from Italy, but from other parts of Europe, particularly Germany, which laid the groundwork for, Nepal for um, Hitler's and the Nazis' desire to take objects back to Germany as well. Now, at the same time as the Napoleonic Wars, we have, of course, the taking of the Parthenon sculptures, or many of the Parthenon sculptures, from Athens to London by Lord Elgin. And this is the place where most people usually start talking about cultural heritage and cultural property. So I added here as an historical note as well. But um, Lord Elgin viewed himself as saving the marbles, not only from the Turks and the Greeks who were living in Athens at the time, uh, but from the French, and if we are to believe it, also from modern air pollution in Athens and all sorts of things over the 200 years, close to 200 years that the marbles have been, have been in London. And Lord Elgin's actions were very much matching what Napoleon was doing. Because while Napoleon was creating Paris as the new Rome, uh, 
the British wanted to see London recreated as the new Athens. And the Elgin marbles or the Parthenon sculptures, depending on what you want to call them, still stand today as sort of the preeminent symbol of both cultural dispossession uh, and also the flashpoint for a lot of at least historical debate. And we see that as well. Uh, this is just another one of the sculptures in the British Museum. Now, speaking of the British Museum, another thing going on at the same time, the late 18th century and the turn of the 19th century, was the establishment of what we call today universal museums or encyclopedic museums. Now, these museums were founded, and the British Museum is perhaps the most prominent example, founded in the middle of the 18th century, that they had a very scientific basis to them. Their goal was to bring together cultural objects th from throughout the world, hold them in one place, categorize them by culture, by time period, and they would be the basis of knowledge and instruction for not only for specialists, but also for the public. And this expressed, along with the Enlightenment movement, the notion of the society of belles lettres. That is that cultured people, educated people from throughout Europe viewed themselves as having more in common with each other than with their particular national groups. So it developed this universalistic notion that artworks belong to everybody. But I think we have to view that statement and that approach very much in the context of what these particular individuals thought. And in fact became, along with as the, the actions of the Duke of Wellington that I mentioned earlier during the end of the Napoleonic Wars, became very much, um, came out of a notion of the law of warfare. That countries should not destroy, should not appropriate cultural objects during war. It was not a matter of legitimate war booty. Um, Another element of the same time period, early 19th century, was the development or the beginning of the development of archaeology as a science, the study of past based as a scientific as well as a humanistic discipline. So uh, William Pitt Rivers, whom you see uh, photographed here, was an early British archaeologist who excavated in England and began to develop the basics for scientific archaeology based on what we call stratigraphy, the science of stratigraphy. Now, this is a cross-section through an archaeological site. Yes, there we go. Uh, drawn a little bit later at the turn of the 19th century, just about 100 years ago, by Sir Flinders Petrie, who worked in Egypt and the southern Levant, the area of the Negev. And you can get the idea of an archaeological site, particularly the types in the Middle East, that are made up of layers or strata. Each layer represents a different time period. And each, in each layer, you find objects. You find architectural features. These are cross-sections through walls, floors. And the idea is to try to excavate, to retrieve these objects in association with each other, with architectural features. And today, we also look for things like faunal and floral remains in order to provide a complete reconstruction of the past. So there's a big difference between going to an archaeological site and pulling out individual objects to appreciate the objects themselves and excavating in a way that allows the maximum of information to be retrieved and a particular time period reconstructed. That's how we learn history. That's how we learn about the past. This was continued by British, particularly British archaeologists. This is Dame Kathleen Kenyon who also worked in the Middle East in the middle of the 20th century, the 1950s and 1960s. And you'll see her drawing from one of her notebooks the same idea, that we can see these different floor layers and different levels, uh, and again, trying to associate them with each other. I know that picture looks out of place, but I'll get to it in half a moment. <laughs> that's, not, that's not an archaeologist, I can tell you that. So we have the, these, all these themes coming together, the Enlightenment, the Universal Museum, uh, the development of archaeology as a science. Now, as I said, up until the end of World War II, the major threat to cultural heritage really came from warfare. And during World War II, we had the largest extent of destruction and theft of cultural objects ever known to human history. Uh, this is a painting by Gustav Klimt of a woman named Adele Blockbauer. It's just here to symbolize one of many thousands of cultural objects, hundreds of thousands of cultural objects that were looted by the Nazis. Uh, this one was returned to the descendants just a few years ago uh, in a protracted lawsuit against uh, Austria. Um, but as I said, these objects are still 
uh, particularly fine art and paintings, are still in the process of being studied and returned to their original owners. But after the World War II period developed another threat to particularly the archaeological heritage. Uh, the study of the past began to combine many different methodologies. I've talked about the science of stratigraphy, but far more sophisticated scientific techniques have been developed over the last 50 or 60 years that are used to develop, to, that are used to study the past. So there is a movement from straight art historical and connoisseurship as a way of understanding the objects of the past, the remains of the past, to an interdisciplinary approach. The advent of these interdisciplinary methodologies coincided with the growth of the international art market in the years that followed World War II, and particularly the wealth of the United States, Western Europe, and later parts of Asia, particularly Japan. The intrinsic conflict between controlled excavation of archaeological sites, which is an inherently slow and painstaking process, on the one hand, and the desire of public and private collectors to have a maximum number of objects available to them, inevitably came into conflict. As the proliferation of interdisciplinary methodologies relegated art historical analyses to become just one of many relevant methodologies for studying the past, this tension has increased concomitantly. Unlike other commodities, new antiquities cannot be manufactured to satisfy market demand unless they are fakes. Therefore, as the wealth of Western nations increased and the art market grew to keep pace with the demand from collectors, the looting of archaeological sites to satisfy this demand became a significant hindrance to our ability to understand and reconstruct the past. So what I'm going to talk about, first of all, is um, looking at three uh, adverse consequences that are imposed upon us as society from the indiscriminate purchase of what I call undocumented antiquities, antiquities which we don't know the about the past or we only know about their relatively recent past. I'm going to try to give you a couple of examples of each of those three kinds of adverse consequences. Then I'm going to move to the law's response. The role of the law should be to minimize adverse consequences that are imposed upon us as a society. And so we're going to look at how the law has responded to this. And finally, I'm going to turn to what I see as the way forward. What is the future potential here? Okay, first, looting of archaeological sites is a widespread phenomenon. It happens throughout much of the world. And it um, is, in my view, market driven. Some people have said, oh, these objects are the product of chance finds. Um, that's generally not the case. Sometimes, occasionally, yes, those tend not to be uh, in very good condition. They're not the kinds of pieces you'd want to put on display in a museum or that a high-end collector would buy. So looting of sites is market-driven. It's done for the profit motive and therefore should be susceptible to legal and other kinds of consequences that would deter, uh, that would reduce demand and therefore deter the looting of sites. Just to give you a few examples, this is a site in Peru. I hope you can see here there's a large architectural feature here, platform. But around this, all these little dark holes are pits in the ground. These were burials that have been looted because uh, skeletons in Peru, human remains in Peru, were wrapped in textiles that are very popular on the market in the United States. So these burials have been looted, and the human remains left simply scattered about so that the textiles could be removed. This is a site in Turkey. This also is maybe a little bit hard to see. Um, this is an artificial mound. This would have been a burial mound. And if you look carefully, you'll see a whole section here has been ripped out. Now, this is not casual. This was done with large, heavy machinery, intentional to loot the site. Another site in Turkey, again, this would have been originally a tumulus or a burial mound that has been bulldozed straight through the center of it, as you see here. Um, so, uh, site looting goes on in the United States as well. This is an early photograph of a looter in Arkansas and a more recent one of looters in caves in uh, Utah going after Native American finds. Uh, this is a relatively recent photograph. These two fellows were actually apprehended and uh, have been uh, served jail time for their activities. And of course, Iraq, 
This is a site in southern Iraq. This photo was taken in 2004. You can see the part of the site that was excavated by archaeologists, nice little rectangles and squares where they worked. And then all around, these are all looter's pits going all the way off into the distance. Another site from Iraq. Again, these are all looter's pits. And these, in fact, are looters still working at the site. And here you see some of them waving. These pictures were taken from an American military helicopter. So they're waving to the helicopter. Um, there are different interpretations as to why they're waving, but I won't go into those right now. Uh, but these are all looters pits. In fact, many of these are actually tunneled underground to connect to each other. So while objects may be coming out, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment, uh, from a scientific or historical point of view, these sites are, are basically ruined. One more piece, and I will talk about this piece again later, but this is a very famous ancient Greek uh, vessel known as the Euphronius Crater, which until very recently was on display in the Metropolitan Museum of New York. Uh, the director of the Metropolitan Museum, Philippe de Montebello, said about this vase, he said many things, but one of the things he said about it was basically, what difference does it make what hole in the ground this vase came out of? Everything we need to know about it is on the vase. Now it is true, this vase gives us a lot more information than most do. Uh, I should mention, by the way, this is roughly 5th century BC, just to situate you. The potter and the painters both signed their names onto the pot, which is a little bit unusual. And the characters are labeled, which I guess you can't see too well in this picture. But we know that the scene depicted is a scene from the Iliad. It's the death of the warrior Sarpedon, being carried off by sleep and death um, to you know, the afterworld accompanied by the god Hermes. So in fact, we know a great deal about this pot. And it was dug up in Italy, particularly as we now know, it was dug up in Italy, so that we believe that it was made in Greece and exported to a certain area of Italy in antiquity. So we know a great deal from the pot itself. But what don't we know? We don't really know exactly where it came from. Did it come from a habitation site? Probably not too likely, but we don't know for sure. It probably came from a burial. Otherwise, it wouldn't be in such good condition. Several other vases by, the same, uh, by Euphronius also surfaced on the market about the same time. We don't know if they were, in fact, found together or not. If so, this was a very wealthy individual the, the vase was buried with. We don't know anything about the person it was buried with. Was it a warrior, as some people have speculated? And the scene on the vase was there to accompany a warrior who himself was killed in battle. All speculation. We don't know what else was with it. We don't know what the burial rituals were. We don't know what the person believed. We don't know what the person died from. Uh, this whole host of information that we could have learned if this vase had been properly excavated is simply an example. So you can learn a lot from the object itself, but we could have known a whole lot more about this particular time period as well as this particular place where this vase was found if it had been properly excavated. So point number one is the loss of knowledge that comes about through the loss of context when archaeological sites are looted. Second point is the objects themselves are not always saved. The argument is that the object, at least, is saved when it's looted. Well, that's not always the case. And I'll give, try to give you a couple of quick examples. This is a relief from the Neo-Assyrian period, which is roughly the 8th and 7th centuries BC. It's from a palace in northern Iraq. This slab of the relief was documented in 1989 by a scholar named uh, John Russell. A few years later, he was asked to look at this photograph. Now, if you look at this fellow over here with this large sort of earring, you'll see this is the same piece. It was chiseled off the, the relief and also recut. You see the orientation of the piece is quite different. Recut so that it would look appealing to sell or to buy as an individual piece. And he was, in fact, shown this. It's his photograph of the piece. It was on the market for sale. So this was done clearly for market purposes. Another example, this is a Native American petroglyph. Down here, you can see the drawing. Um, an individual here with a bow and arrow um, and an animal here hunting. It was removed from its site so that it could serve as a lawn ornament for the looter. So he had this just stacked up in his backyard until he was apprehended. The Gospel of Judas, which actually um, was here in Cleveland, I believe, for a while, 
And this is an ancient manuscript smuggled out of Egypt, kept by a dealer collector because she was trying to get the highest price possible on the market. And it was kept in a vault, bank vault, for many years, something like 17 years. Not proper control. These things are very, very fragile. And from what is understood, all there's, the story is very murky, but from what's understood about it, uh, it deteriorated significantly in condition, and several pages uh, were lost. They fell apart completely. So destruction, again, of an object. And perhaps one of the worst cases of this, this is a church in northern Cyprus called the Kanakaria uh, Church. It dates back to the pre-iconoclastic period, uh, Byzantine period. Uh, the Byzantine church went through a period in which they destroyed objects that had any human representations. And so very few artworks from the pre-iconoclastic period have survived to us to this day. However, this church um, was one such example. This was documented, and these first few photos come from the documentation of the church done by Dumbarton Oaks in the 1950s. And the apse of the church down here, we'll see this later on. Obviously, there are curved surfaces here, and there were original mosaics in C2. Uh, this is a close-up. You'd be looking up at the top of the church. You can see here there were roundels of the 12 apostles. In the corner is four archangels. And in the center, this is the ch Christ child sitting on Mary's lap. And this is what it originally looked like. After 1974, when the northern part of Cyprus was um, the war in Cyprus and Cyprus was divided, the Byzantine churches fell into disuse, and many of them were looted. And quite a few mosaics were taken, and four at least were taken from this particular church. Now, on your left is the original documentation of the Christ child, and on your right is after it was removed, it was sitting in a box uh, in Munich and ultimately sold to a dealer in Indianapolis who then tried to turn around and resell the four mosaics. This is the second one of um, the Apostle Matthew. Same thing on the left, the original Dumbarton Oaks photo. On the right is um, after it was removed. So not only were these chiseled off the wall of the church, but when the dealer wanted to resell them in the United States, uh, they had come off this curved surface, remember, of the church. She decided that it would be easier to sell them if they were flattened. She had a conservator in Indianapolis reset the tiles to make them flatter. And when they put them back in, when the conservator put them back, used crazy glue. Um, so if any of you are conservators, I heard a few moans and groans here, you, your reaction was completely appropriate. Uh, although after a protracted legal battle, these mosaics were returned to Cyprus. They can never be put back. Uh, they can't be put back on the church right now for political reasons, but they could never be put back on the church because they were so damaged uh, in the process of trying to make them appealing to the art market. So the art market does not necessarily save objects. It also damages and destroys them. The third um, consequence of sort of indiscriminate acquisition of ancient art is the acceptance of fakes and forgeries into the historical record. There are some categories of objects which are primarily known only from the market. This is an example. Uh, these are called cyclotic figurines. They date from the third millennium BC. They come from islands in the Aegean uh, between Greece and Turkey. Until recent excavations that were carried out over the last few years, 80 to 90 percent of these are only known from the market. In other words, we don't really know where they came from. They appeared first on the market. And the question is, uh, most scholars think that a very large number of these actually are fakes. Uh, but we'll never know. And since they're made out of stone, it's very, very difficult to test them. Uh, there's not really a conclusive scientific test that can tell us uh, whether they are authentic or not. Uh, and another example, the Getty Koros. This is an archaic, uh, roughly 6th century BC statue from Greece, uh, purchased and currently still in the Getty uh, Museum. And uh, many trees have been killed uh, to, by scholars publishing as to whether this is authentic or not. And we will never know whether it's authentic. If it is, these objects would add a lot to our knowledge. But we will never know. And they may, in fact, be fakes, which then distort our view and understanding of history. So those are some of the, as I said, the adverse consequences that we have. Now, what's the legal response to it? For those of you who thought you were coming to a legal lecture, finally we're getting to the law. Um, and as I said, 
particularly if you view the looting of sites as market driven, then if you decrease the market, uh, decrease the demand, then you should also decrease the incentive to provide the supply. Not everybody agrees with me on that point, but I feel pretty strongly about that. And the role of the law is to impose detrimental consequences on people who violate the law, but who, particularly in the area of dealing in ancient art and antiquities. There has been a combination or a development of a combination of both specific laws that deal with cultural property and particularly antiquities, as well as particular applications of general law that work in particular ways dealing again with antiquity. So I'm going to try to give you a summary of how that works. Now this is a uh, Maya stele. It's sitting very happily in the site of Copan in Honduras. It's not looted, it's not stolen, it's just there to show you because it's in an archaeological park. However, these stele were extremely popular in the United States in the 1960s or so. But they're extremely large and they're very heavy because they're made out of stone. So looters would hack them into smaller pieces, cutting off particularly the sculptural parts or cutting them into smaller pieces and selling them on the market. A, an archaeologist, a scholar by the name of Clemency Coggins, wrote about this. It was one of the first things written in the late 1960s about the threat of the market to the preservation of archaeological sites. Um, in response, the the, actually, the second international convention, the first international convention dealing with cultural property deals with warfare, uh, was written in 1954. The second one is the 1970 UNESCO convention. For the lawyers in the crowd, it has a long name. I'll say it once. It's the UNESCO Convention on the Means of Prohibiting and Preventing the Illicit Import, Export, and Transfer of Ownership of Cultural Property. And I said it in one breath. Okay. Hereafter, the 1970 UNESCO Convention. Um, obviously, it's a much longer convention, but I've extracted the two parts that the United States and most other market countries view as the most important provisions. One is a provision prohibiting the import of stolen cultural property that has been documented in the collection of a museum or similar public or private institution. I'm not going to talk too much about, well, I'm really not going to talk about that almost at all, because it's, it, again, for the lawyers in the group, it changes some of the elements of proof for seizing and forfeiting stolen cultural items, uh, as opposed to just ordinary, you can seize and forfeit um, any kind of stolen object. Uh, change, there are some changes in the law, but not really any fundamental differences of how you deal with stolen property. The more important provision for our purposes is Article 9, which calls on member states, states that are party to the convention, to assist in cases of pillage of archaeological and ethnological objects. Uh, so archaeological and ethnological objects are obviously a subset of the broader group of cultural property, because cultural property is pretty much anything you can think of that has any kind of cultural, historical, religious, artistic, as well as archaeological significance. So we have a broad category and a narrow category. Now, the United States uh, ratified the uh, UNESCO Convention. Um, actually, we voted to ratify it in 1972. The implementing legislation was not adopted until 1983. Convention on Cultural Property Implementation Act, more affectionately known as the CPIA, which is how I will refer to it. Uh, the U.S. implemented both the stolen cultural property section that I referred to before, which I will not discuss again. If there are any questions, we can talk about it later. More importantly, the CPIA allows the president, uh, pursuant to a request from another country that's also a party to the convention, to impose import restrictions on designated categories of archaeological and ethnological materials. And this is worth discussing for a moment to see how it works because this provision allows the United States to prevent the import of what we call undocumented archaeological objects. Remember, objects looted directly from sites that only are known after they appear on the market, they are undocumented because we don't know about their existence until after they appear on the market, or after they appear in a collection, or after they appear at the border of the United States being brought in, as opposed to something that is documented in a museum or a private collection there you can go look up the documents, say, oh, yes, this is what it was. I mean, ideally, of course, it doesn't always work this way. But in theory, if it's documented, it means we knew about its existence and we have an owner, we can return it to that owner. So this provision is important because it applies to undocumented. And that's what you need 
to address in order to deter the looting of sites. Now, the United States has um, entered into agreements, depending on how you count them, either 12 or 13 countries, and um, we'll talk about that in a moment. This, uh, this is actually off the website of the State Department. The State Department administers these agreements. We can first have what's called an emergency action. Emergency actions can't last, last more than eight years, but they can turn into agreements. Agreements last for five years, but can be renewed an indefinite number of times. First country that we had any kind of import restrictions for was El Salvador, starting in 1987. Still in effect, um, well, last renewed in 05, which means it goes up to the year 2010. So that's over 20 years that we've had import restrictions on pre-Columbian material coming from El Salvador. And in fact, most of the countries that we have these agreements with, these import restrictions, are uh, originally it was mostly Central America. Uh, now we also have three South American countries. The three South American countries, the agreements cover not only pre-Columbian archaeological materials, but also um, ethnographic materials, which have a particular definition in the statute. But they cover basically uh, colonial art, uh, colonial ecclesiastical art in the, um, from churches in those countries. This agreement we have with Cyprus also covers uh, what they call ethnographic material, but it covers, again, Byzantine ecclesiastical materials. Um, anyone interested in the subject, this website from the State Department is extremely useful. Now, the important thing is these import restrictions apply, as I said, to designated categories, not to specific documented objects. For example, there is on the website an image database, and this is an, um, a slide off their image database. The, these particular objects are actually sitting very happily in the National Museum in El Salvador. These are not looted. These are not smuggled. These are not stolen. They're perfectly legal. But they stand for, they illustrate examples of these categories. Because something you can't bring in is these particular kinds of figurines from this particular culture and time period from El Salvador. So if you are trying to bring something into the United States that looks like one of these pieces, you need to have an export license from El Salvador in order to bring it legally into the United States. Or it has to have left El Salvador before the import restrictions went into effect in 1987. So you have to do one of those two things. Um, so this can apply to objects that are undocumented that we don't know about until after they appear at the border or on the market. So that's an important concept to get. Two fairly recent and controversial uh, extensions of the import restrictions under the CPIA include the fact that our agreement with Cyprus now covers coins. It's the first time we've had coins from Cyprus covered. And just uh, two weeks ago, the US signed an agreement with China. So now a very broad range of archaeological materials from China are also subject to import restriction. Now another legal route for dealing with objects looted from archaeological sites involves use of the US National Stolen Property Act, which basically applies to any kind of stolen property as long as it's worth more than $5,000 and as long as it has crossed either a state boundary or an international boundary. Um, the lawyers in the crowd will recognize that those requirements, the, the crossing the boundaries, is in order to give federal jurisdiction for what otherwise would be a state crime. So dealing in transporting, selling, trafficking, in other words, in stolen property that's crossed state or international boundaries becomes a federal crime. Now, how does that apply to archaeological materials? Many nations that are rich in archaeological heritage, beginning over the past century and more, have vested ownership of archaeological objects that are still in the ground. Uh, they have vested the ownership in the nation. That means a looter who comes and takes something out of the ground without permission is committing theft. And when you take it out of the country, it's theft. And the United States courts have recognized that those objects are still stolen property after they come into the United States. There was an earlier case in the 1970s called the United States against McLean, which first established that principle. But more recently, it was reaffirmed in a case called the United States versus Schultz that involved probably the most prominent New York antiquities dealer, a man named Fred Schultz, who was conspiring with a British conservator. Uh, the British conservator basically uh, went to Egypt 
And he, uh, this is the original, well, not the original, but it's the a sculptured head of a pharaoh from the late um, second millennium BC. And the British conservator would cover it up. These are the same piece. Make it look like a cheap King Tut tourist trinket, get it out of Egypt, to take it back to London, and then restore it. They created a very elaborate fake provenance and fake collection. They pretended it came out of an old collection. Um, the restorer restored it to look like an Egyptian style that was popular in the 1920s and 30s. They um, took labels that they made up from type script that they had from that time period. Um, they soaked them in tea and they put them in the microwave to make the labels look old. And then they proceeded to try to sell them to various museums, uh, in particular in the United States. Um, it didn't actually sell. And this piece, I think, is still in England subject to a variety of legal issues because one of, anyway, it's very complicated involving bankruptcy and other things that have nothing to do with antiquities. Um, but Mr. Schultz was convicted of conspiring to deal in stolen property. Uh, this a head of Amenhotep III, as well as other Egyptian antiquities. So the case, which attracted a great deal of attention, went up to the Second Circuit, which affirmed the conviction, saying that, yes, this object removed from Egypt in violation of Egyptian national ownership law is a stolen object under the US's National Stolen Property Act. As long as the object was in Egypt at the time the Egyptian law was passed, which was in 1983, and as long as it was found within the modern borders of Egypt. Um, those are two requirements that are not always that easy to satisfy from a legal point of view. And again, we can talk more about that if there are questions. But that's the basic idea. And recently, uh, a case in England called um, uh, Iran suing a gallery, the Barakat Gallery, uh, alleging that various objects that this gallery was selling were looted from a site, the Giraffe sites in uh, Iran, the British courts affirmed the same principle. So we have it both in the United States and the United Kingdom. Now, there's some more general law that I'll mention quickly. One is that a lot of times these objects are essentially smuggled into the United States. They're not properly brought into the US, usually for a failure to properly declare them. This is a gold bowl, a fiali, uh, that uh, originated from Sicily from, I believe it was the fourth century BC, purchased by the New York collector Michael Steinhardt for about $1.2 million. The dealer who brought them in, or the Swiss dealer, it's a complicated story, the Bull, the, the US dealer picked it up at the Swiss-Italian border, uh, transported to Zurich. You know how long that takes? It's a couple of hours. And then it was shipped to the United States. They declared the country of origin as Switzerland instead of Italy, because Switzerland doesn't have the same kind of national ownership laws. And they lost uh, about a million dollars off the value. Uh, it was purchased for 1.2 million, and they declared its value at $250,000. Uh, this was seized and forfeited by US Customs for the misdeclaration, uh, particularly of country of origin, that the country of origin was, in fact, Italy, where it was dug up in modern times. And a more recent case, in which um, didn't become a full-fledged court case, but these are sculptures of the Gandharan period uh, from Pakistan. And again, they were brought into the United States. The importer declared their country of origin as being Dubai. And the government seized and forfeited these and have returned them. This was getting ready for the repatriation ceremony as these were going back to Pakistan. So standard anti-smuggling laws can often apply. You may have read uh, about a little over a year ago, several museums in Southern California, as well as a dealer and uh, um, collector in Chicago, uh, were served with search warrants and seizure warrants for an elaborate scheme of smuggling of antiquities out of Asia, Thailand, Cambodia, also China, bringing them in, smuggling them in, into the United States, and then um, being bought by a collector who turned out to be an undercover agent, who then donated them to museums at inflated values. Um, so it was an elaborate scheme involving all these people together, and the IRS was, in fact, one of the lead, not the only but one of the agencies that got involved here. And it raises a lot of questions about donations of antiquities, to which there may not be title, or have some other cloud because of smuggling, uh, to museums. So again, that's a whole other direction we can go in. Now, uh, particularly the use of national ownership, the concept of national ownership that I mentioned before, has been used as the basis for repatriating objects over the last several years. Back in 1993, the Metropolitan Museum of Art returned a collection of over 360 objects known as the Lydian Hoard to Turkey. These are just two objects from it. 
Uh, never fully litigated, but it was basically a recognition that Turkey was the owner based on national ownership laws. Turkey had actually acquired these in the 1960s, and there was evidence that one of the junior curators from the Metropolitan staff was actually in the field in Turkey buying directly from the looters. Um, more recently, you may have read about repatriations from several museums, including uh, the Cleveland uh, Museum here, that goes back to a raid on a warehouse in Switzerland that belonged to this fellow, uh, Giacomo Medici. And the evidence from the warehouse showed thousands of documents dealing with objects showing, in some cases, uh, them being brought out of the ground or with the dirt in the trunk of the car, being cleaned up in this warehouse. And then apparently Mr. Medici would go around and be photographed standing next to the pieces. And you should recognize this is the Euphronius crater I talked about earlier. Um, as a result of pressure that was brought on these museums and a great deal of publicity over the last three or four years, several museums have been returning pieces. Uh, the Euphronius crater, as I mentioned, just went back to Italy. The Metropolitan Museum returned about 20 pieces. A group of silver objects from probably from the site of Morgantina, we'll never know for sure exactly where from, uh, that went back to Italy as well from the Met. Uh, the Boston Museum of Fine Arts returned this beautiful sculpture. Again, we don't know exactly who of or where exactly it came from. Uh, maybe a Roman empress and several um, ancient pottery vessels as well. And the Getty, which probably received the most attention. Uh, the Getty curator, Marion True, uh, has been on trial now for several years in Italy for conspiring to deal in stolen property. I should mention, if you remember the Conicaria Mosaics case I talked about, she's actually the heroine of that case, um, but unfortunately uh, has gotten caught up in these other uh, issues with the Getty. The Getty has returned uh, more than 40 objects. Uh, this is an example of an architectural antifix. Uh, this is a gold crown. Uh, at one point, Italy and Greece started uh, cooperating with each other. This is a gold crown that was sent back to Greece. And on your left is a sculpture, an archaic period sculpture that the Get Getty sent back to Greece. And on your right is a large um, cult statue, over life-size cult statue that may be from Sicily um, and may represent the goddess uh, Aphrodite. We don't actually, again, know for sure. In addition, other museums, including the Princeton Art Museum, Cleveland Museum of Art, have entered into agreements to return objects to Italy. With these agreements, sometimes the objects are allowed to remain on loan. And there are promises and agreements that Italy will lend other objects in exchange uh, for the objects that are going back to Italy. In addition, uh, before I get to this slide, um, a private collector in New York, Shelby White, one of the largest collectors of antiquities, has agreed to return or has returned um, several pieces from her collection. And a dealer, Jerome Eisenberg, of the Royal Athena Galleries in New York has also returned several objects to Italy. OK, so that's the law's response. Now, what do we see for the future? And I want to sort of um, conclude with three categories of observations. One is that I don't think that either of these legal developments or the public pressure is the end of the art market in ancient art. Rather, what I think I see, and there's beginning to be some evidence of this in market statistics, what I call the bifurcation of the market. The market is splitting into two parts. One is objects that are provenanced back at least to the 1970 date. Many museums, and I'll mention this again, have adopted that 1970 date from the UNESCO Convention, although it has absolutely no legal significance have adopted 1970 as a part of their ethical um, codes or their policies that they want to trace back the history of an object to 1970. So what I think we'll see is a separation of the market between well-provenanced and not well-provenanced objects, with the well-provenanced objects receiving higher value. On your left is a statue of Artemis, the goddess Artemis with the stag. It was in the Albright Knox Gallery in Buffalo uh, since I think the 1930s. There is a newspaper photograph of her, which unfortunately I don't have to show you. Um, but she, there is a newspaper photograph of her wearing as a necklace her export license. <laughs> so that's pretty good. That sold at Sotheby's in June of 2007 for 20, roughly $27 million. The highest price at that time ever paid for any sculpture, 
and the highest price ever paid for an antiquity. Now, fine art goes, you know, do you remember that beautiful golden picture I showed you before of the Holocaust? That sold for $135 million. So antiquities don't usually get that expensive. But $27 million was a pretty hefty price for a well-provenanced, well-known, admittedly, accepted piece. Well, that record only lasted for six months. Because on your right is a piece called the Gwen Lioness. Now, the image is a little misleading. It's actually about this big. It's about three inches in height. It's tiny. And it's exquisite. And if any of you have studied uh, Mesopotamian art, um, you'll probably view this as an iconic piece. It's in every basic introduction to ancient Near Eastern art. It was purchased in Baghdad in the 1930s. So it even predates. The Iraqi national ownership law goes back to 1936. It was purchased before even its national ownership law went into effect. And it had been on display in the Brooklyn Museum since 1948. In December of 2007, it sold for approximately $57 million. Now, some people would say, in the case of both of these, well, they went for such high prices because they were well-known pieces, they had survived the test of time, they were viewed aesthetically as very important as well as historically. But I have to believe that the high price is partly the result of their really excellent provenance. This is not going to cause anybody any legal problems when they buy these pieces. They will not have to return them to anybody and lose their value. Um, so I don't think it's the end of the market, but will the market increase in value for the well provenance pieces? Probably yes. I mean, what's going to happen in the short term to the market? That's a whole different story with the economic situation. But I mean, in general, a bifurcation of the market. Second point, I mentioned the fact that these agreements are leading to um, promises of loans in exchange. Now, this is a sculpture, a Roman sculpture, that was loaned to the Boston Museum of Fine Arts when it returned the other pieces that I had mentioned to, uh, to Italy. It is a well-known piece. It was excavated in 1986 in Rome. It's a statue of the goddess Irene, which means peace. And she was um, supposed to be holding in her hand um, a symbol of wealth, basically. It was um, actually in two pieces. The Romans had never put the head. The head and the body were separate. When it was sent to the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, the museum conserved it and put them back together. It's the first time it's been displayed as a whole uh, since ancient times. But it's a perfectly well provenance piece. We know exactly where it's from. We know that it's authentic. All the things that we said that are bad about acquiring undocumented antiquities did not apply in this case. So a second avenue for the future is long-term loans. And when I say long-term, I mean long-term. Like I could see countries entering into agreements to lend things for 20 years, 50 years, things that can then be treated um, not as part of the permanent collection in that the, let's say, the American Museum wouldn't necessarily own them but they would have sufficient stability that you could count on the piece being there for you to see or to become parts of exhibitions. So interinstitutional cooperation and long-term loans is a very important key, I think, to future developments. Um, third is just this past summer, the two major leading museum associations, the American Association of Museums and the Association of Art Museum Directors adopted new policies that um, call for museums to not acquire pieces unless their provenance history can be traced back to 1970. We are not entirely sure yet how that will be applied. Both policies allow some loopholes. In particular, the AMD policy says the museum can depart from the 1970 date if it weighs, on the one hand, um, the value of acquiring the piece against the risk of financial and reputational harm to the museum. Um, in that equation, I find lacking the question of harm to the historical record and harm to the ownership interests of the country of origin. But leaving that aside, um, it certainly is a very interesting development. The AAM has called on museums to search their existing collections of antiquities to make known provenance information or lack thereof. And the AMD has established a registry that when a museum acquires a piece, it does not go back to 1970. They are supposed to post the piece on this website. This is the only piece so far that's been posted. This has only come into effect in June. I'm, well, I mean, it's only been six months. I'll give them a break. Um, this is the only piece that's posted. It's a Ganesh Steely um, from India. 
Uh, it was purchased by the Portland Art Museum. It has very meager provenance history. Uh, the provenance history goes back to a Christie's sale in 2000 with no earlier history, at least publicly available. And um, I think the question is, will the registry become a way for museums to say, as the Portland Art Museum pretty much said, well, um, we don't really know anything about it, but we'll post it on the registry and that kind of salves our conscience. Or will it be something that, in fact, is very rarely used? Only, in other words, that museums will depart from the 1970 date only under very unusual and rare circumstances. Now, finally, there we go. OK, I'm going to take the leap and talk about the Cleveland Apollo. I usually end my lectures this way, and I was going to change it, but I said, no, nope, just because I'm in Cleveland, there's no reason to change what I talk about. <laughs> um, Many of you, I'm sure, are familiar with this. Um, all I know about the piece is what I've read in the newspapers. And I will start with the caveat that perhaps there is more information available. But it was purchased, or the acquisition was announced in June of 2004. Uh, the provenance history, let's just say, is rather sketchy. Um, many people doubt uh, at least the story as it has been publicly stated. Uh, the dealers that it was purchased from uh, have had several, let's say, brushes with the law. They're very litigious, so I have to be careful what I say. Um, but in the same month that the Cleveland was buying or announcing this purchase, um, one of the dealers was being prosecuted in New York for smuggling an an another antiquity into the United States. So um, if one relies on the um, dealer from whom one purchases, I would say this was uh, a questionable decision. We know very little, really, about its legality. And um, I'm sure people here from the Cleveland Museum would um, uphold its authenticity. Um, but a lot of that study remains to be seen. And my understanding is that this is something that the museum will, um, as the Getty has, approach in good faith with the Italians to try to resolve whether it's um, uh, just what it, both its legal and uh, authenticity status is. If it's authentic, it's an extremely important piece. Uh, very few bronzes have come down from ancient times to us. So if it, particularly if it's a Greek bronze, um, it would be an extremely important piece. But um, at this point, I will say at least publicly, we don't know very much about it. Um, I will, and I will just contrast that with, again, this piece that the Boston Museum of Fine Arts has on loan from Italy about which we know a great deal. We can appreci appreciate both of these pieces aesthetically, but we can only really appreciate one of them historically. And that's the question that remains. Which one will be the typical scenario in the future? Or will somebody be talking to you in 30 years about how, what a shame it was that the Cleveland bronze um, doesn't, that we don't know more about it than we do? So as I said, we can appreciate both of them. They're both beautiful pieces. We can appreciate them aesthetically and as individual objects. We can appreciate and enjoy both of them. But only one really adds to our knowledge and understanding of different times, different places, and different people. So thank you. Yes. Yes. Um, I, have, well, I have a question. I'm a curator at a museum at Oberlin College, which is oh. about 45 minutes from here. And we do have a small collection of antiquities. And one of my goals for the year, obviously having followed everything with AAMD, is to get all of our all of our works posted online with their provenance and on the website too in the coming year. But I, I wonder, you know, besides doing that and besides obviously not acquiring anything more that would have any suspect provenance, do you have any particular suggestions for museums in, at this moment? Well, I think my focus is mostly on what's newly being acquired. <coughs> Because my concern is with contemporary looting of sites. Mm -hmm. In a sense, you know, I often get asked, what do I think about the Parthenon sculptures? And you know, I have some views about that, but that's irrelevant to the question of contemporary looting. Mm -hmm. So I think what museums are either recently or currently acquiring is the most important issue. So if you're following, you know, really following the 1970 day, that mm -hmm. separates you from contemporary looting. Mm -hmm. Um, I think posting online the information you have is wonderful. And if you're able to do that, that's great. Depending on the countries that you're talking about, I mean, you know, should everybody be running to Italy and Greece and saying, I have this particular vase? You know, I don't know that that's really necessary. Mm 
But in the cases of some countries, particularly, for instance, African ethnographic material and tribal art, those countries really have very little of their own. There's been, during the 19th century, there was so much colonial, and really up until the mid 20th century, so much colonial based um, appropriation that they have very little of their own collection. And one thing to do is to either return or to lend uh, back to those countries and try to create, um, the British Museum is actually doing a lot of very creative cooperative um, exhibitions and loans with the former colonized countries, which I think is a real model for museums to follow. I don't know if the Oberlin Museum is of the size and capacity to do that. But for museums that are, I think going to parts of the world that really are culturally deprived of their own history, as well as actually about, you know, lend these countries other kinds of art too, not just their own art. Um, but we often don't think about those countries so much needing um, those kinds of cooperative arrangements. Thank you. Yep. I realize this, the theme of the Bigger Nord year is museums, and you spoke a great deal about this issue with regard to museums. Could you speak to the issue of uh, the private market in, in stolen property? Particularly in terms of antiquities? Yes. Okay. Well, in fact, sometimes museum directors will say, great, you know, we won't buy these things, but the private collectors are still buying them. And so it doesn't stop the market. Um, first of all, the legal principles that I've talked about apply equally to museums as they do to private collectors. And private collectors and dealers have had objects seized and forfeited and returned. Um, and for instance, Mr. Schultz was a dealer. Um, you know, museum curators are not being hauled off to jail and that sort of thing, uh, except for poor Marion Fru. In Italy, that's an exception. So. Um, but I do think that what museums do, have, what museums do has an impact on what private collectors do. If the acquisitions of museums are defined to include donations, gifts from private collectors, then that has an impact on what a private collector will buy. Friends of mine who work in the market, and I do have friends who work in the market, <laughs> um, say that really at the high end, a private collector wants to know that he or she may someday be able to donate to a museum. So the museums are an indirect way of deterring what the private collector does. I mean, private collectors are not subject to any ethical rules. They're subject to legal rules, but no voluntary codes of conduct and that sort of thing, which museums are voluntarily subjecting themselves to. So I think what museums do have an indirect impact on what private collectors do, admittedly indirect. I also think and I'm not sure I can prove this, but I think that the fact that a private collector can donate to a museum um, means, and I'm actually using the statistic based on something that Shelby White wrote, who was a major collector, as I said, and who has donated lots of pieces, that basically she saves about 25% of the value of what she buys by donating, if you're in a high enough income bracket, which I assume she is. So, that means that, in many countries, that's not true. They, many countries um, don't have that same tax deduction in exchange for a donation. So I think that, on the international market at least, American collectors are therefore, if they contemplate the possibility of donating artworks, are willing to pay a premium, a higher price, for objects because they know that they might be able to recoup some of it through an ultimate donation. Now, I know not everybody donates all their art collection, but that's something to keep in mind. One thing that I think needs to be fixed, and this case in California that I mentioned about the tax fraud that went on, as well as the smuggling and looting and theft, I, th I think that um, the IRS and perhaps Congress need to take a look at the donation of antiquities for which good title is not being transferred. If you make a donation, but you don't really own the object, then you're not donating anything of value. I know museum people are probably horrified when I say this. But the truth is, if you're donating something without title, you can't convey legal title, then you're not donating something of value. And that should affect the deductibility of the value of the donation. Because we, in fact, as taxpayers, are subsidizing this system. Every time a donor gets a tax deduction through the entire you know, American tax system, we are subsidizing that. And I think there ought to be some um, more careful look. Right now, there's something called the Art Review Panel, 
in the IRS. Um, I won't go into all the details of how audits are done and whatever. Very little is looked at when a donation is made. And when something is looked at, it's usually for whether the valuation is correct. Issues of title and legality of the object are rarely, if ever, looked at in the IRS process. So that's something that could be fixed, tightened up. Um, in back. That slide you showed that had the two objects that were sold, that were very well documented and sold at such high prices. Yeah. Uh, I was just wondering, why did the museum sell them? They sounded like they were such valuable pieces of their collection. OK, well, the, the lioness was actually not owned by the Brooklyn Museum. It was still owned by the original owner and had been on loan since 1948 to the Brooklyn Museum. The Brooklyn Museum did not choose to sell it. Um, and I believe what happened was the owner died, and uh, the children wanted to set up a foundation. It was basically owned by a foundation. And they wanted the funds to put into a, the, uh, the endowment of the foundation. So it was not the museum's decision. And they, I believe, were very unhappy. You know, they weren't happy about it. Now, the Albright Knox, on the other hand, um, and I don't want to get too far because it's a whole other lecture into the whole issue of deaccessioning right now for the purpose of providing funds to museums or universities. This has been a huge issue over the last couple of days and for the last couple of months. Um, but the Albright Knox, um, they sold not just that one piece. They actually sold their whole collection of antiquities, which they had quite a few. They had a lot of Chinese pieces that were really, really magnificent and all of which sold way above value. They raised altogether about 60 or so million dollars, which they put back into their acquisition fund because they decided to refocus. Uh, they decided they wanted to focus on contemporary and modern art as opposed to ancient art. And I think a lot of um, particularly smaller museums view contemporary and modern art as being a better draw uh, to their community as opposed to ancient art. Um, I don't know if that's true or not. So they were refocusing the collection, basically. I'm trying to come up. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, who do you think was next? You want to go ahead? <laughs> OK. Many of the European museums have American 501c3s to contribute to the American corporation. The friends of? What? The friends of the other institutions. The other question is, what if you get a commission from the National Museum of a particular country? From a legal point of view, that's not the U.S. is not going to view that. I don't think as stolen or illegal. So um, the other country may want it back. Doesn't mean they're going to get it. And they can't be a country that's going to Well, right. But legally, the U.S. owner hasn't done anything wrong under U.S. law. If they come to the U.S. to sue, you're going to be judged by U.S. law, not the law of the other country. I will say that hasn't happened so far, at least. Um, that's all right. <laughs> um, well, I guess I have a comment and a question. First, my comment is I'm, I'm kind of surprised that you have so little faith in curators and conservators that they'll never be able to tell the difference. Um, uh, between the fakes and authentic psychotics, for, for example, um, and, and uh, in their uh, increasing expertise and methodologies. And so that, that rather surprised me. But my question um, Are you a curator? I was. You were. Okay. And, um, but my question is um, that. I mean, you showed one slide of a, of a site in Turkey. You didn't say what the name of it was. It uh, looked very much to me like Bubon, which was a uh, very important archaeological It looked site. like what? Bubon, which B-U-B-O-N, which was a very no, important... No, it's not that, but yeah. Oh, OK. Well, Bubon was actually dynamited by the Turkish National Oil Company mm -hmm. um, um, in search of oil. And so all of the... Um, uh, Roman remains that were there um, were, were dynamited by, by the Turks. And, um, and, and then I'm very familiar with the people who were building the subways in, in Athens and Rome. And they were charged to stop when they ran into archaeological objects, but, but the man who was actually the head of it said, look, you know, at a million dollars a day, how long do you think we're going to stop? And so I guess my question to you 
is how will regulating the market um, preserve the objects that are being destroyed by just by natural human progress, by the building of hotels, highways, oil fields, et cetera, et cetera. Okay. Um, and there's no doubt that human activity, as well as natural, like erosion, destroys sites. And there are a lot of examples from the Three Gorges Dam in China, to the dams being built in Turkey, to development even in the United States. I mean, there are cases all over where you, um, some countries don't have the appropriate laws, some countries have the laws on the books, but they're not sufficiently enforced. Um, and there is also corruption in many parts of the world that also, like the developer may be paying somebody off, that kind of thing. And that's absolutely, you know, I don't deny that it ha that happens. Um, but I think I have two answers to that. One is that it, that, that does not justify the additional destruction that comes for the purpose of the market. In other words, the market adds on to that. So it's not that what I'm saying will stop it necessarily, but why add on to it? And it's very hard to tell people you can't develop, you can't build a hydroelectric dam. We're going to keep you living 100 years ago and not have electricity and not have any of these things because we want you, know, we want you to preserve the site. Um, but I do think that as these countries, particularly as we enter into these bilateral agreements with these countries, we, um, something that's often not noticed. Now, we don't have an agreement with Greece and we don't have an agreement with Turkey. But if you look at the agreement with Italy and you look at the new agreement with China, there is a whole section devoted to things that we want to see the other country do. And that often involves things like better regulation of development and particularly enforcement of the laws that they have to protect sites from development. Um, we provide training to the other country on how to do those things, how to enforce their laws, how to deal with customs, all those kinds of issues. So it actually opens a dialogue between the United States and the other country, ways that we think they can do better. A whole other area is through organizations like the World Bank, and which funds some of these development projects. And we have worked with the World Bank to get them to put into their provisions that they, I mean, unfortunately, the World Bank doesn't fund as much development any longer as they used to. But they now have provisions that require what in the United States we call cultural resource management, CRM provisions, that before you do, before they will fund a development project, they need to you know, do survey, they need to talk to the stakeholders, they need to find ways of preserving or excavating sites before they're destroyed. So there's no question there's a lot of work that needs to be done out there. But, um, and because I talked about the market, doesn't mean I'm not aware of and working on these other aspects as well, because those are all excellent points. Some are and some aren't. Um, I don't, what? Creating a legal market is a very uh, mixed, um, double-edged sword. Uh, and I know that's something the AMD has pushed forward as part of their new guidelines that they've adopted. I be personally believe that if countries want to create a legal market, that's fine. It's their choice to do so. It's not a way of preserving sites. And in fact, when a country has a legal market, it essentially destroys any legal effect we want to have in the United States as a deterrent. Um, and I can, there, the countries. There are ways to preserve sites that have nothing to do with, with the market. I mean, they, they have entities to preserve sites. Right, but the countries that do have a legal market, and Israel is a very good example of that. Um, by having a legal market, it means that you can no longer tell which objects are legal and which objects are illegal. Japan has a perfectly Japan's a totally different kind of story. And actually, they have some problems in Japan as well. And England as well, which also has Roman objects, not all Roman And England has, massive, has a lot of looting going on. So, you know, the United States has a legal market. We have a legal market in Native American antiquities if they come off of private land. The problem in the United States and in England is that the burden, if you want to stop somebody from looting a site on public land, and we have lots of laws in the United States to prevent that, government has to have the burden of proving 
did a particular object come off of public land or private land? So unless you catch the looters in the act, as I showed those guys in the cave at the beginning of the lecture, you can't control it. You can't stop the looting on even public lands. You can't enforce our laws. So the countries that say no legal market at all can enforce it because they don't have to prove did it come off of public or private land. So if a country chooses to have a legal market, and the United States, I think, always will because of the way our private property is dealt with here, um, it is a, is a substantial hindrance to enforcing the laws that we do have to protect sites on public land.